great opportunity to really be uh, able to minister to people, uh, single moms uh, with unplanned pregnancies, an opportunity to really make a difference. So I encourage you to stop by the table in the back. There's a variety of different ways that we can get involved in this, uh, helping to provide uh, things that they need and uh, maybe groups to be part of, discipleship, that type of thing. Stop by and talk to Lily at the table in the back, and we would love for you to get involved that way. A couple things that I want to uh, say here. Uh, first of all, thank you to all of you who are joining us online. We're glad that you're here today. And uh, for those who are in our mask on service over in the auditorium, welcome. We're glad that you're here today. Uh, I want to correct Pastor Luke. This is my time to rebuke him. It wasn't high V. It's a different organization that is providing those matching funds. So we apologize, wrong information. Uh, we'll get the right information, but this not high V. just want to clarify that. They are a great organization, a great company, and they're very benevolent. Uh, this particular matching thing is not high V. So, but we can still give matching funds. It doubles whatever we give, and we're thankful for the opportunity for that. Uh, so I am glad that you're here today. Some of you, I know there's like a couple people right in this section right here in this service that are really excited to be here, and uh, I think all of you really are. I just know, I know that. Um, I also want to say, I don't know if you came today expecting Sunday school. You saw a note on the door. We just began Sunday school last Sunday. We've had Wednesday night classes, two Wednesdays, and we had to make a tough decision to kind of put that on hold for the time being. It takes people to make those programs happen. And our children's ministries, uh, we're really coming up short, and uh, we just felt like there's no way that we can move forward uh, and, and be able to staff all of that. Uh, it was getting more difficult. Every day we're getting more calls. And so um, our numbers of COVID are up in the area. It's affecting our church. We have people who are quarantined, people who uh, are sick. And so be in prayer. The, the, just pray for God's health and strength. And, uh, but that's just the reason why we're putting that on, on pause for just a little while. We'll be communicating, evaluating as, as we go. It's, it's a tough decision when you've put all the work and effort into getting those programs up and going to say, let's, let's, let's hold off. But uh, we felt it was the best thing to do at this time. So we are beginning a new sermon series today in the book of Romans. Romans chapter 1, if you want to turn in your Bibles there, I want to give you just a little bit of background information uh, while you're turning there. Romans is the first of the Pauline epistles. What is a Pauline epistle? It's just a big word uh, for a letter that was written by Paul. Paul, uh, there's 13 of the books in the New Testament, which are actually letters from Paul. This is the first in, in the order of those. Romans is the, the first one. Uh, so, this church in Rome, Paul is writing a letter to Christians who are in Rome. Those Christians uh, or Jews who had been in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost, they had uh, experienced that outpouring of Pentecost in Jerusalem, and uh, they took this good news and what had happened in their lives back to Rome. And uh, so they had heard about the church in Rome, but none of the apostles to this point had been there. You can read through Paul's other letters. He's, he speaks often about his desire to go to Rome. He hadn't met with any of them. He had conversed, uh, you know, by, by letter with, with some of them. Uh, but his desire was to go to Rome. In the book of Romans, we have the, the most basic comprehensive statement of what the gospel is in all of the Bible. Paul uh, is a logical guy, and I think he probably could have been a lawyer, but he, in a systematic way, knocks down every argument against the gospel and shows us that Christ, it's Christ in him alone that is our hope for salvation, not just in the first century where he was writing to, but in the 21st century and beyond. It's the same God. The Romans is, a, is, is God's plan of salvation and righteousness for all of humankind. So, is everybody there? You're there at Romans chapter 1. You got your Bibles, your electronic devices. We're in Romans chapter 1, and I'm reading from the New Living Translation this morning. We're going to start at verse 1 and read through 17. This letter is from Paul, a slave of Christ Jesus, chosen by God to be an apostle and sent out to preach his good news. God promised this good news long ago through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. The good news is about his son. 
In his early life, he was born into King David's family line, and he was shown to be the Son of God when he was raised from the dead by the power of the Holy Spirit. He is Jesus Christ, our Lord. Through Christ, God has given us all the privilege and authority as apostles to tell Gentiles everywhere what God has done for them so that they will believe and obey him, bringing glory to his name. And you are included among those Gentiles who have been called to belong to Jesus Christ. I am writing to all of you in Rome who are loved by God and are called to be his own holy people. May God, our Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ give you grace and peace. He says, let me say first that I thank my God through Jesus Christ for all of you because your faith in him is being talked about all over the world. God knows how often I pray for you. Day and night, I bring you and your needs in prayer to God, whom I serve with all my heart by spreading the good news about his son. One of the things I always pray for is the opportunity, God willing, to come at last to see you. For I long to visit you so I can bring you some spiritual gift that will help you grow strong in the Lord. When we get together, I want to encourage you in your faith, but I also want to be encouraged by yours. I want you to know, dear brothers and sisters, that I planned many times to visit you, but was prevented until now. I want to work among you and see spiritual fruit, just as I have seen among the other Gentiles. For I have a great sense of obligation to people in both the civilized world and the rest of the world, to the educated and uneducated alike. So I am eager to come to you in Rome Two, to preach the good news. For I am not ashamed of this good news about Christ. It is the power of God at work, saving lives, uh, saving everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. I know there's a lot there, and we're going to be working through the book of Romans, Romans. Um, but I'm just going to take this section, and where I want to focus this morning is on verse 16 and verse 17. He said, I'm not ashamed of this good news of Christ. In some of your versions, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. This is the New Living Translation. It's the power of God at work, saving everyone who believes, the Jew first, also the Gentile. This good news tells us how God makes us right in his sight. This is accomplished from start to finish by faith. As the scriptures say, it is through faith that a righteous person has life. All right. So when I say Henry and Doris, how many of you know what I mean? Raise your hand high if you know what I'm talking about. How many of you do not know what I'm talking about? All right. Well, you're going to be educated this morning. So my wife and I, for the past 30 years, have played these characters that dress up in polyester, of all things, and uh, we are the spiritual pillars of the church when we, when we get into costume. Well, back in April, when everything was kind of shut down, we had too much time on our hands, and we decided, let's do some Henry and Doris, put it to video, and we put it out on social media. So I want to share with you one, maybe two of those videos this morning, and on this theme of Paul saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. So in this video, we're taking the gospel to the streets. Watch this story. <laughs> No, oh, I just love evangelism, Doris. Yeah, well, Getting out and taking it to the streets. Well, Spreading well, love to them heathens. Well, we are generally known as the pillars, pillars of, of the assembly. assembly. That's, that's just one interpretation of street evangelism. <laughs> I, what I want to tell you is a little backstory behind this. Of course, we have someone filming or videoing this, this as we're sit out here on 70th Street in our polyester. While we were getting set up, people were honking their horns going by, and my daughter Brianna was recording this. And I had to edit out so much of that video, it, it, the parts that I wanted to use, because in the background behind this, I hear her say, 
oh my goodness, oh my. <laughs> she was so ashamed <laughs> to be seen with us. I'm thinking, you know, it takes a lot of guts to put on bright yellow pants and go sit out on the street and wave and yell at cars. But that's what we do for the gospel. I, I would have to say, Henry, as Paul would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. Well, I've got one more video if you want to see it. Anybody up for another one? Okay, this is another one of my children, and it will just obviously highlight to you uh, being ashamed or embarrassed. Here we go. No yellow pants this time. This is back when we were recording we're here at our services New online. Hope. They're recording for Sunday morning. Just stopping by to see if they might not need our help. <laughs> I love in this story because you don't have to see to be seen by Jesus, but rather Bartimaeus, he used what he had and he heard. He said, I've heard about this guy named Jesus. I heard what he can do for people. I heard what he can do for people. Oh, Henry Norris. Hey, Pastor. Uh, what are you guys doing here? We're in the middle of recording right now. Well, I would just stop by to see if you might need anything. Uh, we're good. We don't need anything from you guys. Sure. Well, Pastor, I just want you to know that we are with you 100%. Great. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, All right. We'll you, be guys, you guys have a great day. We'll be All seeing right, you. Pastor, you have a good day. I'm glad they are not my parents. Wait, what what'd you say, Pastor? Uh, nothing. I was just telling everybody that I think you guys are out running errands. Oh. oh. <laughs> yeah, you're probably day. right. Yeah. Enjoy the errands. <laughs> For those that don't know, that's my oldest son. So, yeah, glad they're not my parents. Is there anything that you're ashamed of? Embarrassed about? Talking about Henry and Doris reminds me of an experience I had probably 15, 16 years ago. And our children's pastor at the time was Bud Fortney. He's a tall, bald-headed guy, six foot six, pretty intimidating guy. But he, he had uh, this character that he played called Richie. And Richie uh, was a young, kind of a squirrely kid who had pants that were super high water and just a goofy, squirrely guy. And uh, so he played that character. And we thought, hey, this would be fun. We can dress up in our costumes, Henry and Richie, and go pick up his daughters from school. So... <laughs> At the time, Kristen, their oldest, was in high school, and um, Cassie was in middle school. And Johnson, when the middle school and high school were right next to each other, right on Northwest 62nd Street. So we drove up to the school afterwards, and we were going to pick them up. Well, middle school gets out first, and we're standing out there in the parking lot in between the two schools, and we're just waiting for... Uh, for Cassie to come out the door. And once she walks out the door, we start yelling her name and we're all in costumes, standing out right in front of everybody. And we're saying, Cassie over here, Cassie. She looks, looks, sees us standing there and she just lets out this, that's my dad, that's my youth pastor. She was so excited that we were there and we were calling her and she was so excited to be identified with these two goofy characters. Not what we were expecting kind of pop the, the air out of our balloon, so to speak. So we wait a little while, and high school lets out, and we wait for Kristen to walk out the door. And uh, here we are just standing there, and uh, we see Kristen walk out the door, and we do the same thing. Hey, Kristen! Kristen! And she looks, and she sees us, and it's like this look of horror. Like, <gasps> and she puts her hand over her face, turns like this, and walks straight back into the school. <laughs> I don't know why. We waited for quite a while until I think every other student had left the school before she actually came out of the building. <laughs> I realize that there's something different between a middle schooler and a high schooler. But it seems like as we get a little bit older, we get a little bit more sophisticated and we might be a little more ashamed of some things. We learned that. I wonder how many of us can truly say, as Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Can we say, as he, as he did, I'm not ashamed. To be ashamed is to be embarrassed, to be humiliated, to be mortified, apologetic or regretful. But Paul says, I am not ashamed. And what he's saying is, I'm proud. I am unashamed. I'm bold and I'm confident with the message that I have. 
And I say that in a day where uh, there's all kinds of evil and wickedness coming out of the closet, I think it's time for the people of God to come out from under their rocks, to stand on the rock and proclaim, this is who I am in Christ, and let's stand up and be bold for the truth in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Are you with me today? Can we say I'm not ashamed? Two weeks ago, I preached about God being omniscient and omnipotent, that God knows everything and that he can do anything. There's nothing that God doesn't know. There's nothing that he can't do. And he's given us power through the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit that lives in us. The the same spirit that raised Christ Jesus from the dead lives in us as Christians, as believers. And he gives us power for salvation. He gives us power for living holy lives. And he gives us power to witness. Acts 1.8 says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. And you will be my witnesses. Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the very uttermost parts of the world. And I said that to be a witness, all you have to do is tell what you know. Tell what you've seen. Tell what your experience is. That's really what it is to be a witness. And I talked about outrageous candy bars. How many of you remember me talking about that? One person. Angelia, thank you. Out, this is yours, Angelia. Here you go. See? See how easy it is? You just talk about something and witness, and somebody says, Liz, I'll take that. It's a free gift from Jeff. Thank you, Jeff. You're welcome. <laughs> I'm telling you, when you're a witness and you give testimony to something that you've experienced, especially like a great candy bar, I'm saying that this is the greatest candy bar. If you love peanut butter, it is the greatest candy bar that you would ever sink your teeth into. It's got Reese's peanut butter wrapped with caramel, and then on top of that is chocolate with Reese's pieces. Mmm. How many else? How many else want to be... There we go. All right. One more. One more. Wait, how many did I give out? (laughs) Thanks, Luke. (laughs) All right. Now, it's easy when you experience something that is amazing, that's great. I mean, it's just easy to tell people about what you know, right? Easy to tell people what, you've, what your experience has been. How many of you are a follower of Jesus and you've been saved through Jesus, what he did on the cross, and you've, you've been saved, you've been set free, and you are a follower of Jesus, okay? All right. How many of us tell, tell about that? How many of us share our faith? We say that we're not ashamed. I think that we want to say that I don't want to be ashamed, but do we get as excited, as bold, as confident about sharing about our food experiences or uh, as we share about our sports team or politics or whatever it might be when it comes to sharing our faith? Why don't we share our faith the same way? I've just got four points that I want to share with you this morning, and it comes right out of this verse 16. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone. The first point is this, not ashamed. Paul says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. What a testimony. I'm not ashamed. Why would Paul even think about or consider or be tempted to be ashamed of the gospel? Well, I'll tell you why. He is writing a letter to Rome. He's from Israel, right? Paul is uh, writing this letter to Rome, which is the capital of the world, the proud city of Rome, uh, the capital of the world in his time. Uh, was home to some of the, the great philosophers. And they had innumerable gods. In Rome, they had gods for everything, every day of the week, every, uh, everything that you could think of. There was a place for a god. So they had all these gods. It was a little bit intimidating uh, when you talk about Paul. And Paul's talking about this good news. This good news was about a poor Jewish carpenter who had been crucified. This poor Jewish carpenter from the little country of Israel that Rome had conquered, one of the small countries that they had conquered. Um, and this was, this was crucifixion, the lowest form of execution reserved for the most vile of criminals. And he's telling this good news about this carpenter, this common, ordinary guy who was executed, crucified on a cross. So why would they pay attention to a story like that? 
some carpenter that rose from the dead. Listen to what Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. He says, the message of the cross is foolish to those who are headed for destruction. But we who are being saved know that it is the very power of God. That's what he's talking about. I'm not ashamed of this gospel. And he goes on a couple verses later in verse 20 to ask this question. Where does this leave the philosophers, the scholars, the world's brilliant debaters? God has made the wisdom of this world look foolish. God says of himself in Isaiah 55, he says, My ways and my thoughts are so much higher than your thoughts ever can be. I want you to think about this. Paul was just a little Jewish tent maker going to the big city of Rome to preach a message like this is almost comical. Yet he says, I'm not ashamed. He was confident in his message. You know, there's some people in this world that ought to be ashamed. A rapist ought to be ashamed. A thief ought to be ashamed. A gossiper ought to be ashamed. Lying politicians in our government ought to be ashamed. Doctors who murder unborn babies still in the womb ought to be ashamed. Every single one of us ought to be ashamed of our sinful actions. But we should never be ashamed about what is right and what is true. Jesus said in Mark 8, 34, calling the crowd to join his disciples, he said, if any of you wants to be my follower, you must give up your own way, take up your cross and follow me. If you try to hang on to your life, you lose it. If you give up your life for my sake and for the sake of the good news, you will save it. And what do you benefit if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? Is anything worth more than your soul? If anyone is ashamed of me, If anyone is ashamed of me and my message in these adulterous and sinful days, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory with his Father and with the holy angels. Hmm. He said, look, if you're ashamed of me now, I'm going to be ashamed of you then. What are we ashamed of? What are we embarrassed about? You see, Paul got, when Paul got saved, he was persecuting the church and he was leading an all-out war against Christians. But after he encountered God, he didn't slow down. He didn't change gears. He simply switched sides. He went from persecuting Christians to saying, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God, the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. Second point, power. Rome was a powerful empire. They had built great highways and massive bridges. Their military was unmatched by any other in the world of that day. The Roman emperor was the most powerful person on the planet Earth at that time. But Paul knew, as we should know, that there is no greater power, there is no greater power than the power of God. Rome doesn't compare Any other world power, for that matter, doesn't compare. The power of God was something that Paul experienced personally. He met Jesus on the road to Damascus, and he experienced God face to face. Paul saw God do miracle after miracle and demonstrate his power in so many ways. We need the power of God demonstrated in our own lives. But his spirit lives inside of us. It's not hard for him to do. I think we all understand and have some idea of the power that the world and sin can have on a person. Habits, temptations, hang-ups, vices. But once once we receive the, the free gift of salvation that Jesus offers and experience his forgiveness, listen, the world doesn't have the world doesn't have a grip on us anymore. The world doesn't own us. Not that you won't have struggles or temptations. But Jesus said this, or John said this in 1 John 4, 4, greater is he who is in you than the one who is in the world. The spirit of God that is in you is greater than any of the power of, of of the enemy in the world around you. There is power in the good news of Jesus Christ. The gospel is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. With Jesus, we have a greater power in us than the power of alcohol, than the power of drug addiction, than the power of pornography, than the power of gambling. There is a greater power available to you as a child of God than all the demons of hell can muster together. Yeah. 
The power that's in you through the Holy Spirit is greater than all that the enemy can do all at once. That power is in us. That's good news. We are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ. Paul said, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The word for salvation is soteria, which means deliverance. You see, a doctor in medicine can help try to deliver you from sickness. But the gospel delivers you from the penalty and the power of sin, and it saves your soul. That's salvation. Every one of us is lost and condemned to hell without Jesus. And if we're gonna be saved, our only hope is faith in Jesus. This is what Paul says in Romans 10, 9 and 10. If you declare with your mouth, Jesus is Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be, you'll be saved. For it's with your heart that you believe and are justified, and it's with your mouth that you profess your faith and you are saved. I'm not ashamed of the gospel, for it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes. The word for everyone is a Greek word, a simple little three-letter word, pas, P-A-S. Pas means all. It means all things, all kinds, all men, all people, any, any at all, anyone, anything, everyone, everything, every kind, every way, always and forever. The gospel is available to everyone. This little Greek word says that the gospel is not inclusive. It, it is not exclusive. It is completely inclusive and it is available to everyone, everyone that will. The Bible says that Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. For whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. The question is, are you and anyone? Anyone means any one. Are you and anyone? We're all anyone. The people that you live with in your home, they're anyone. The people that live in your neighborhood, anyone? The people that you work with, are they anyone? This message, this gospel is so inclusive, it is available to everyone who believes. Anyone can be saved. We just have to humble ourselves. We have to admit that we're a sinner. We have to admit that we're sinful. We have to ask for forgiveness for our sins, but Paul says that the gospel brings salvation to everyone who believes. He says, Paul says this in Ephesians chapter two, we are saved by God's grace through faith, by believing in him. He says, you can't, you can't take credit for this. It is a free gift from God. Salvation is a free gift from God. You can't earn salvation, it's only through Jesus, and he offers it as a gift. Paul says in Romans 6, 23, the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Free gift. I got, I'll, I'll save that till later. I want, uh, I'll see if I can get more takers. Free gift. Why do we make it so hard? See, you may know about the faith, you may, may have seen the faith, you may understand the faith, but you don't have the faith until you receive the faith. You have to reach out and take the gift. You may not even really be able to say that you have a gift until you receive a gift. So if someone were to ask you, did you receive a Christmas gift, and you say, yeah, it's up in the room and it's still, still unwrapped, is that really your gift? You haven't really taken possession of it. What is it? But when you take that gift, you unwrap that gift, you hold that gift in your hands, you have taken possession of it. You didn't get anything because it's not your gift until you receive it and you accept it, and it's the same way with the gospel. If you don't know Jesus, salvation isn't gonna come to you through osmosis. Salvation isn't come to you just because you're sitting in church today. You only get Jesus when you understand that he loves you, he sent his son to die for you, and by faith and through prayer, you take hold of that gift of God.
So as the worship team comes, I want to ask this question. How, how many of you today need God's salvation? Those who are watching online, you know that there's something missing in your life. You know that you can't be free from those things that bind you without Jesus in your life. It's, it's salvation, and it's a free gift from God. How many of you today would say, and I'm, normally we might ask people to bow their heads and close their eyes, but here's what I can tell you, that in this room today, in our mask on service today, that most people that are sitting here have already bought into this. They've already believed in Jesus. You saw many hands raised earlier to say, I'm not ashamed. I'm a follower of Jesus. So we're in company here where this, there's, there's, there's a positive uh, reinforcement here. This is a good thing. But if you have not made Jesus Lord of your life or you're not living in that place where you are living uh, saved and set free and delivered from the power of sin in your life, today is the day just to open your life to Jesus and say, come into my life and save me. It's a free gift. But it has so much greater rewards than a candy bar. I mean, this is eternal. The joy I get from eating one of these doesn't even compare. And I love chocolate. Anyone here today with everybody's eyes open and you would say, just raising your hand, Pastor Jeff, I need God to save me. I'm just looking across the room. And if that's you, would you just raise your hand? I, listen, we're all for you, every person in this room. I mean, if you raise your hand, I, applause is going to erupt here. Offering you something so great. It's amazing. The hope and the peace and the joy and the love that you experience through a relationship with Jesus. Is there anyone here, anybody watching online today, you just raise a hand where you are and say, I want Jesus. You don't have to jump through a hoop. All you have to do is say, Jesus, save me and forgive me. Give me what he's talking about. And he'll do that. Anybody here? Don't be ashamed. How many of you sitting here would say, I'm not ashamed of the gospel. I ought to ask you to stand here, but listen, this is the easiest thing to do because <laughs> everybody else thinks the same way. What, what, where the rubber really meets the road is out there. Are we not ashamed? How many of you say, okay, I may not be able to say I'm not ashamed, but I want to say, I want to be able to say I'm not ashamed of the gospel. If that's you, would you stand today? Either saying, I'm not ashamed. I don't want to be ashamed. I want to be a out there, visible, vocal, witness, testimony of God and his presence and his power and his peace and his goodness and his kindness and his mercy and his grace and his love. Why, why would we be silent? We need, we need God to be magnified. Make him large in our lives. And to do that, we have, we have to decrease so that he can increase. This is a song that I want us to sing together that just is a testimony and a prayer of our saying, Christ be magnified in me. Listen, I'm gonna tell you, Paul, who said I'm not ashamed of the gospel, you can go read about him and the persecution that he faced. By standing, you're not saying I'm looking for an easy road. This is not easy. It's not gonna be easy persecution. You, you want to talk about persecution? There's Christians who are being persecuted and their lives taking hundreds of thousands a year across our globe. Are you willing to, to stand up and say, I'm not ashamed? Let's pray. Holy Spirit, rise up in me. Be magnified in me. As we pray, and if you're watching, uh, joining us online, and you raise your hand or someone here uh, Maybe you didn't raise your hand, but in your heart you're saying, I want Jesus. It's just a simple prayer to say, Jesus, forgive me of my sin. Come into my life. Let your spirit live in me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on a cross, for overcoming death. 
for living today. You are a living God. What you have done for us is the gospel message. I don't want to be ashamed. I want to be bold. Let the light and life of Jesus live through my life that I might be a witness, a testimony of God, your goodness, your power, and your mercy. Thank you that we can taste and see of you, Jesus, and find that you are good, that you're beyond anything that we can can even put into words. Thank you for salvation, the free gift. Thank you for saving us. Thank you for living in us. Thank you for giving us the power to live in this dark world, to be a light, to be salt, to be a testimony, to be a witness of who you are. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. May we be your true followers. May we not be ashamed. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. One more. One more. Uh. All right, there we go. Hey, take the message. Here's the deal. The rubber meets the road out there. That's where it all happens. Let's be bold. Let's take a stand. Let's be strong. Let's let Christ be magnified in us to the world around us. God bless you.